Hello everyone. We'll just wait uh, for one, two minutes and then uh, we'll start. Uh, in the meantime, uh, there will be a, uh, a small exercise. So get yourself some pen and paper. If you still have that, get yourself some pen and paper in the meantime. So welcome uh, everyone this morning or evening, depending on where you are uh, from. So welcome very much uh, to the second of our uh, presentation in our series on design ethics. And we are very, very honored to have with us uh, uh, Bagya Friedman, uh, he's a professor in the at, um, Information School at the University of uh, Washington. and. Uh, she, is, uh, she has a long, many years of experience of working in this area and developed an approach that she was talking about on value sensitive design. Maybe a little bit about uh, Batya. Uh, so she's a professor in the information school, but she also has a young positions in the Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, as well as in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering at the University of Washington. Uh, so you can see that she really tries to bring together different, uh, different fields. Um, she co-directs the Value Sensitive Design Lab um, and also the University of Washington Tech Policy Lab. Uh, so she, it's really, I think, with, with her ideas, uh, plays a very important role. To, and I know not just at the University of Washington, um, but her work is very much uh, appreciated uh, she has received um, uh, in an ACM uh, Sikkai Social Impact Award, um, and um, she has also received an honorary doctorate from Delft University of Technology. Um, and I think what she will, uh, I think I know <laughs> what she will be talking about today is, as I said, about value sensitive design, really an, an approach where you count for human values. And that is really what this uh, series of three lectures is about, um, to think about design, not just as, oh, we are developing uh, systems, products, uh, policies, or uh, services, um, but that we do change things with that, that there are humans involved, that there is ethics involved in what we are, are doing, and that we need to think about these futures. Um, I'm really looking forward to the presentation uh, today. As I said, for your, those of you who joined slightly later, uh, please have some paper and a pencil uh, uh, handy or with you because uh, uh, there will be a small design exercise in the middle of all of this presentation. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, if you can please use the chat. Uh, and at the end, I will go through the chat and then uh, see to group the questions and post these questions uh, to Batya. And I hope we have a wonderful discussion after the end of this presentation. And now, with further ado, uh, I'd like to hand over to Batya. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lucien. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to um, share my screen now. Let's see. Great. Yep. So I'm very pleased um, to be here with you all and have a chance to talk with you about value sensitive design and 
um, get you thinking about the possibility to engage with both your moral and technical imaginations as you do um, your technical work. Um, as uh, Lucien mentioned, I've been working on value sense of design for quite a long time, several decades now. And um, when one does this kind of work, one doesn't do it alone. So I want to take just a moment to acknowledge some of the really wonderful colleagues I've had the privilege of working with um, over many years, including Alan Borning and Dave Hendry, um, with whom I've just co-authored a book on value sense of design and a recent PhD student, Daisy Yu, who now actually has a professorship in Eindhoven. So you see all of these things are um, closely intertwined. Um, to begin, I would like to um, talk with you about the ideas of moral imagination and technical imagination. And to do that, I'm going to um, read to you from the very beginning of the book that um, Dave and I published in 2019 that brings together several year, several decades of work. And the book begins with a quote from Robin Darnath Tagore from 1922. And Tagore writes, the water vessel, taken as a vessel only, raises the question, why does it exist at all? Through its fitness of construction, it offers the apology for its existence. But where it is a work of beauty, it has no question to answer. It has nothing to do but to be. Then Dave and I write, in these few words, Robin Darnas Tagore gently points us to the human condition. We learn from Tagore that being with our tools gives consideration not only to functionality, but also to human flourishing. Thus retelling Tagore's story of the water vessel, we might say, every human being is entitled to clean water to drink and a vessel from which to drink that water. That's the functional piece. And that vessel should be beautiful. And that is the human flourishing piece. So for all of us, in the things that we do and build, there is the functionality of what we're doing, but also attending to who we are as human beings and what it means to flourish or live a really full life as a human being. And the tools and technologies we build um, enable that kind of flourishing. In the work that we have done over many years, we have um, explored a pretty wide range of definitions for human values. And after a time, we came to rest on this one. Um, this working definition says, human values is what are important to people in their lives with a focus on ethics and morality. And so calling attention to two aspects of this uh, definition, what is important to people in their lives? We can only ask that by talking to the people themselves. And then again, with a focus on ethics and morality, that has us look at what are the ethical and moral considerations. So I'd also like to point out that um, tool use is a fundamental part of the human condition. If you go back and look at, you know, um, ancient, ancient um, archaeological digs of people, the early people, you see them using tools. So our tools shape how we interact with and experience the world which in turn lead to new tools. And as Winograd and Flores wrote in 1986, in designing tools, we are designing ways of being. So when we build our tools, our technologies and infrastructure, we are actually building the environments in which people will live their lives and experience themselves as human beings. So we really are designing the very beingness that people will experience for themselves and of themselves. Um, this is one of my favorite tools. You can see a picture of it there, but I've got the real tool right here. It's a um, what we call a flathead uh, screwdriver. And um, this tool is very well designed for turning screws. So if I have some screws to turn, um, it's an excellent tool to use. Um, not only that, not only is the screwdriver designed for that purpose, but the screws themselves were designed so that they could be used with this screwdriver. So the infrastructure of screws and screwing 
and the tool of the screwdriver all fit together. Now, I've also used this tool for other things. Um, usually in um, the autumn here when I'm planting my bulbs, I've been known to go out into my backyard and dig some holes uh, to plant those bulbs. So um, this is a really good tool for that as well. And if I am trying to open a paint can, um, it's pretty good for prying up those lids. However, if what I wanted to do was ladle soup, um, and trying to do that with my uh, screwdriver wouldn't work very well. And so it's in that way that we can see that the tools we design, they make certain kinds of tasks very easy. Others are hard to do, but doable. And some um, are just not possible. So thinking more generally, technology shapes our interactions, which in turn shape human experience and vice versa. Our human experiences then shape the technologies that we build. And so we have this interactional cycle of um, the things that we build and how they um, impact or shape our experiences. And then through those experiences, we reshape our tools. Our tools enable what is easy to do, hinder or make what's hard to do but doable, and prevent certain things or make them impossible. So let's just think for a minute about um, communication and having some kind of communication pipeline. If I have a very big pipe, it's very easy for me to get messages across from one side to the other. If I have a very small pipe, not very big, then I can still get those messages across, but I have to push a lot harder. And if I actually cut that pipe, so there's no path through, then I can actually make it impossible for there to be communication. I would have to redesign something else entirely if I was going to enable some form of communication. So as you're engaged in your own design work, as you build things, you can think to yourself, what is it that I'm enabling? What is really easy to do with the things that I'm designing? What things are still possible for people to do if they wanted to, um, but hard? And what is it that I've actually prevented or made impossible? Then what is value sensitive design? Well, it's an interactional theory, meaning it takes very seriously this notion that um, we design the tools um, and infrastructure and technologies around us that shape our being. And then through that experience, we then redesign those tools and couples that with a method that accounts for human values in a principled and structured manner throughout the technical design process. So the idea here is how can we as technologists, as engineers, from the very beginning of a design process, foreground human values, not simply our technical requirements, but um, the kinds of requirements that come from the fact that our technologies are going to affect human beings and potentially other creatures in our lives and carry that through the design process as part of our um, design criteria, our evaluation criteria, as we um, think about the constraints and move through the entire design cycles. Now, when um, Working on human values, um, you may hear things like privacy by design or security by design, where one value is um, called out by itself. <clears throat> but in live life, um, the values that we hold exist in a very delicate balance together. So when I pick up on privacy, I often pick up on trust and security and safety. If I pick up on freedom of expression, Along with that may come um, dignity and identity. So these values in our lives coexist in this delicate web, this delicate balance. When we um, introduce a new technology, along with the functionality that comes with that technology, we may do something to perturb that balance. Now, maybe that perturbation is actually something positive. It shifts the values in a direction that is more aligned with what um, people desire, with um, the things that they hold dear and important. Or maybe in perturbing those values, um, 
we do so in a way that actually um, needs to be rebalanced. And so we always wanna ask the questions, how is it that the artifacts that we're making are impacting um, people's experience of the values that they hold? In doing our work, we also um, pay a lot of attention to stakeholders. So those are the people who are affected by the technology. We talk about direct stakeholders as those who have their hands on the technology, they're actually touching it. So for example, if we were talking um, a while ago, at least in the United States about medical record systems, we would say for medical records, um, the physicians um, are a direct stakeholder. They're gonna see the records. Um, the um, person who does the scheduling, the nurse might see the records. <clears throat> An insurance company might see the medical records. Um, but typically the um, patient wouldn't have access to their records. And so we talk about that group of people who are affected by a technology but may never touch it directly as being indirect stakeholders. And in doing our work, we try to systematically surface all of the key stakeholders who will be affected, whether they're directly touching this technology or not. Um, many of you probably have a device like this, a cell phone. And when I'm holding it and using it, I'm the direct stakeholder. But when I'm riding on a bus in the evening and I want to be quiet, and the people next to me are all talking loudly on their phones and I'm hearing their intimate conversations, then I'm an indirect stakeholder with respect to the same technology. So these are about the roles that a person plays in relation to the technology. And a single individual may have different relationships to that technology at different points in time. What you see here on this slide are um, images from some of the projects that we've been engaged in um, over many um, decades, including um, security for um, implantable medical devices like a pacemaker. Um, in a large software organization, there's a knowledge-based system for managing code, a large public university that has um, a public camera. Um, you may recognize something that um, was known as um, a garden that was, um, you were able to plant seeds and water them and care for them through the internet by using a robot arm, um, the telegarden. So we've worked um, on projects around a whole range of technologies. And that, um, that choice was intentional so that in developing the theory and methods for value sensitive design, we wanted to avoid um, blinders that might come from focusing on just one kind of technology or another. So because value sensitive design <clears throat> ascribes to an interactional theory around how it is that technology affects people and then in our designing, we reshape those technologies. When you step back and think about the implications for that, it means that um, we'll need to um, do several different kinds of investigations, and those investigations will need to be iterative and integrative. So first of all, we're talking about values. So we'll need to understand what those values are. So we'll need to do some kind of conceptual work to arrive at working definitions. You know, what do we mean by trust? What do we mean by privacy? You know, for some people, privacy means um, being able to control the information about them. For other people, privacy means um, the ability to be left alone, to withdraw from society. So two very different um, ideas about what privacy is and depending upon which idea you're using, um, a system may or may not be consistent with your view of privacy. And then what we're interested in is people and their experiences. So we can you know, armchair um, what the values are that will be important, what their working definitions will be, who the stakeholders will be. But at a certain point, we need to go to um, the people who are gonna be using the technology 
to understand how they view what these technical systems might be, um, what aspects of the values are important to them. Are there other values we didn't consider that they would bring forward? Are there some that we focused on initially that they would tell us are not so important? Um, all of those things require empirical work. Um, they're, they're not questions that we can answer in the design process by just sitting in our offices, sitting in our armchairs. And then because ultimately we're interested in tools and technology and infrastructure, we'll need to do some technical work. So based on these empirical investigations, we may come up with some technical designs that we think are going to do a good job with respect to the values and functionality that's desired. And then once we've done that technical work, we may come back and bring them to the people and do a different set of investigations empirical investigations to see if indeed that technical system has resulted in the um, value experience that people tell us are important. And maybe by interacting with the technology um, that we've designed, they may come back and say, oh, here's a value I didn't realize was important to me, or here's a stakeholder that we hadn't thought about who's actually going to be implicated in important ways, and we need to bring them into the design process. If a new value surfaces, we may need to go back up and do a conceptual investigation. We may need to come up with a working definition for that value so that we can then think about how to address that within um, the technical system. So you can feel the iterative and integrative aspects of these different kinds of investigations. Okay. So that's a lot to take in in um, a very short period of time. And to make it all a little more, um, I would say, concrete and meaningful for you, I thought what we could do now is try a design activity. So this is when you're going to need um, a pencil and some scratch paper. So if you don't have those handy right now, um, take a minute and um, get those for yourself. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a technology to you, a design prompt, and we're going to do a little design work and then share some of our, um, the results of our design work. Okay, so with that, we'll begin. So um, the technology that we're going to work with is a hypothetical technology. It's called Sleeve. So Sleeve is a hypothetical embodied technology which uses a brain computer interface, so something here at the back of my brain, to detect the wearer's affective states. So it will detect my emotions. And then it's going to display those affects through an e-textile garment. So imagine that um, my jacket was a sleeve, then um, the fabric of my jacket can change colors, texture, and shape according to the feelings of the wearer. So if this brain machine uh, interaction, if this implant detects a certain emotion, then it will change the color of my um, jacket. So let's say it detects that I'm feeling a bit angry. Maybe my jacket turns red, that kind of thing. Sleeves can be worn by people such as those with autism to help make their emotions more accessible to the people around them. Okay, so this is our design prompt. Is there Anybody who has a question about what the technology is that we're going to be designing with? If so, please put your question into the chat and then um, Lucien can uh, read that to me and we can make sure everybody understands the technology. So any questions there? No, okay, great. So this is the technology we're going um, to be working with. And the first method that we're going to use is something called an envisioning card. So um, this is a toolkit that we have developed, which um, brings together um, over a decade worth of work on value sensitive design and some of the key ideas. Um, it comes in a packet like this and the cards look like this. And you'll see one of the cards on the screen there. This is a perception of a value card. So on one side, the card has an image and a title. And then on the back side, 
it has these different categories of stakeholders, time. This one is values. You can see the word written large and pervasiveness. Again, on the flip side, you'll see the title, Perceptions of a Value. And then below that, you'll see a theme. So this is the theme around perceptions of a value. So sometimes stakeholders have different perceptions of the definition of a specific value. For example, some may define privacy as having control over your information versus those who define privacy as being left alone. So that's the value of privacy. And then it has a design act. So a very specific design action that you can take to explore perceptions of a value. So in this case, it says investigate a value. In user studies, have participants write a brief one to two sentence definition of that value as it relates to the system. Identify any substantive differences participants in participants' perceptions. So this design act is asking you to do some empirical investigation to find out how it is that users um, really think about the meaning of the value that you're working with. And this query can fit into your regular user study. So if you're doing some kind of user study, it's not like you have to go do a whole brand new big thing. You can just slip in <laughs> one or two extra questions to elicit this information so that you can begin to use it within your design process. Okay, so this is an example of the envisioning card toolkit and the structure of the cards. Now, we're gonna be working with sleeve. So remember sleeve, this is our hypothetical embodied technology. I have a brain computer interface. Um, it um, will detect affective states and display those affects through this e-textile garment. So the fabric will change colors, texture, and shape according to the feelings of the wearer. That's the technology we're gonna work with. And now the first um, challenge that I would like to do is I'd like you to use um, this envisioning card, card number one for us, which is consider children. And you'll see that this is an orange stakeholder card. It says children often appropriate systems originally designed for adults. How might this system influence a child's social and moral development? And if you like, you can do the specific design prompt. You can either think about that general theme or you can do the very specific design act of developing a scenario um, that portrays a seven-year-old interacting with the system. Okay, everybody understand what you're gonna do? So I'm gonna give you three minutes. I have a three minute timer right here. You can see it right there. I'm gonna flip it over. And for three minutes, what I'd like you to do is consider children in relation to sleeve and write down um, all of the ideas that come to you. Okay, here we go. You can start.
Okay, we've just about run out of time. So I'm going to ask you to finish dotting that I, crossing that T, finish that last thought. And now what I'd like to do is ask you to consider a different card. This card is a blue card. It's from the value suit. And um, it is a card about value tensions. So value tensions occur when supporting one value in a technology challenges another. So for example, sharing more information in a social networking system may support sociability, but reduce privacy. Um, they can occur within a single individual, so I can feel a tension between conformity versus autonomy, between an individual and a group, so my individual privacy versus national security, <clears throat> or across different groups, so a culture that values independence versus a culture that values interdependence. So what I'd like you to do now is brainstorm some value tensions that your system may engage and um, begin to think about the design features that favor these um, values. So again, I'm going to give you three minutes. I'm flipping over my timer and go now. Okay, we're just about out of time. So again, if you would um, dot that last I, cross that last T, get that last idea down. And um, now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute. And um, I'm gonna ask you um, if something interesting occurred to you through using any of these cards that you'd like to share, 
um, go ahead and raise your hand. And then I'm going to ask Lucian to call on people. And um, I'd like you to tell us which card you used and um, just one interesting thing that occurred to you. So just one. So go ahead now, if uh, you have something you'd like to share, go ahead and raise your hand and then Lucian will call on you. Hey, who would like to raise their hand? <laughs> Uh, that's Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Great. So, Daniel, go ahead and unmute and um, tell us which card you used and one interesting thing that um, occurred to you by doing this uh, using the envisioning card. Well, I, I'm not certain I, I've gone through this properly, but I would you like me to discuss the value intention component? Um, tell us which card and then just one thing that was interesting for you. Oh, oh, I said if if the students if the value slave is displaying a student's emotions when the student is frustrated, how might that how might a student not wish for that emotion to be displayed on their sleeve would be the tension. Mm -hmm. And did that did you surface that when you were considering children or when you were using the value tension card? Uh, the value tension card. The value tension card. Okay, great. Um, is there someone else who um, surfaced something different than that that you'd like to share with us from either the consider children card or the value tension card? Don't be shy. Maybe I can, can add. I thought, you know, immediately maybe because of background. Uh, when looking at these values, they really triggered things. They thought, oh, hey, I need to think a bit further. Uh, but also, immediately, the sort of things, oh, maybe, whatever, there is a switch off button if I don't want, you know, because of the privacy versus, uh, I call it care, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know what a child feels, really feels, then I can't help. Yeah, uh, so, so that sort of dilemma, but on the other hand, the child may not wish to do so. Uh, so I think what came up were also ideas of, of how to teach yourself sleeves that may mm -hmm. have to be uh, because of that, or parents who may wonder, where is this data going uh, mm -hmm. about my child? And will it be seen as the child is always angry of the child? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are, I think a lot of issues when you when you think about that. Mm -hmm. And for you, did those come up in relation to the consider children card or the value tension card? Uh, for, I think first the the the, uh, the children card, and I noticed when I wrote things down that I started seeing tensions. Mm -hmm. like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, yes, this is good. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, this is bad. So when you came with the cards, uh, it it sort of gave. Um, it pointed that out uh, even mm -hmm. more. And in practice, we often um, use several of the cards together. So I think the kind of thing, Lucian, you were just naturally doing is what happens when you work with this uh, toolkit. Um, great, thank you for those. Um, is there anyone else who came up with something different when you were thinking about children, when you use the Consider Children card? Something. Yeah, Chandrima? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear. Okay, so um, I would say it's like very different. It's kind of same thing that Lucian has shared. Um, so I feel that there are a lot of kids uh, who do have anger issues, anger management issues. So I think the sleeve may help those the, the kids themselves to understand the emotions. So when they realize they're angry, they may make efforts to calm down by themselves. I think it's useful for the kid and the parents, but when it comes to interact with other kids, I feel there's a tension in there because if the other kids who play with this kid always sees him or her angry, I think it may affect the social interaction. So I think that that's where, so those are my few cents on, on, the, uh, on the children cut. Great, thank you so much. 
Let's hear from one more person, um, Abdullah. Uh, hi. Uh, so uh, I hope my voice is audible. Yes. yes. So with children case, uh, actually there are two scenarios. Either they are autistic or normal children. With normal children, what I thought is like uh, it will lead to a lesser development of skills, be it like way of communication or expression. But with autistic children, it will definitely help to as an add-on uh, to uh, to their app capability, which will uh, share their feelings and easier for other people to understand. So this is what uh, uh, I thought of this. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you all for sharing these. So you can see how just these two cards, thinking about sleeve, help you to surface a lot of considerations very quickly. Um, what I'm going to do now is go back to sharing my screen. And um, what I'd like to do now is share with you um, a second method. Um, so the first method we were using were the envisioning cards. But now I'd like to share with you a method um, that we call value scenario. And again, about sleeve. So in um, human computer interaction, we have a very well established method called scenario based design. When you do scenario based design, you usually are thinking about one user in front of a technology and you're focusing on the functionality of what the system offers. But you use stories or scenarios to help you think about um, the interaction. With a value scenario, similar to scenario-based design, we're gonna use stories, but instead of um, being focused entirely on the functionality, we're gonna really think about some of the value implications. So we'll think about some of these stakeholders and we'll think about some of the um, pervasive uptake and longer term considerations. So I'm gonna share a value scenario with you now about sleeve. So as you know, sleeve is a hypothetical embodied technology which uses a brain computer interface to detect the wearer's affective states then displays those affects through an e-textile garment. The fabric can change colors, texture, and shape according to the feelings of the wearer. Sleeve can be worn by people, such as autistic persons, to help make their emotions more accessible to the people around them. Mabel is an autistic adult. Sometimes it is difficult for her to share how she's feeling, especially when she is experiencing stress or anxiety. Mabel's friend Imani heard about sleeve and bought one for Mabel's birthday. Now, Mabel can wear her feelings on her sleeve, allowing her friends to understand her mood by reading the garment signals. So Mabel is a direct stakeholder here. Mabel loves that she can communicate her emotions to her friends using this new visual language, but sometimes the way sleeve feels against her skin is uncomfortable. Now, Mabel's friend Luca dislikes sleeve. Luca feels like some of the emotions that sleeve displays should be kept private. Of course, Luca wants to know when Mabel is anxious, but now Luca can see when Mabel is feeling embarrassed, annoyed, or ashamed. This is similar to some of the issues that you raised with children. As a result, Luca has started spending less time with Mabel. Luca is saddened by the distance sleeve has created in their friendship. So Luca is an indirect stakeholder. She's not using the technology herself, but she's still affected by it and it affects her friendship with Mabel. Now, a few decades have passed and the technology that underlies sleeve has become ubiquitous. Not only do people wear sleeves, but so do homes, buildings, and buses. Building sleeves display the aggregate affect of the people inside. If the people inside are in a good mood, the building seems joyful from the outside. Occasionally, a building's aggregate effect will become so negative that people stop entering. There are abandoned, angry buildings all over major cities. So we can begin to think about what happens with this technology longer term when there's widespread uptake, when it's used more pervasively. And then finally, while sleeve technology seems to be applied to everything these days, there are individuals who have chosen not to use their sleeves. Sometimes they turn the sleeve off. Sometimes they remove the sleeve altogether. The sleeveless, as they're called, are perceived as secretive, aloof, 
or suspicious by sleeve users because they don't offer complete emotional transparency. But in fact, the sleeveless have relearned how to communicate and perceive emotions the old fashioned way by empathizing with others around them. So that's a value scenario about sleeve. And in just this short uh, 15 minutes that we've spent on this design activity, you've seen a whole range of issues um, that foreground human values around this technology of sleeve, this e-textile. And you've had a chance to um, use two value sensitive design methods or see them in action. The envisioning cards, so um, these cards, and then also a value scenario, which is um, a very structured scenario for bringing forward the value implications and longer term pervasive effects of a technology. Um, so that um, gives you a sense or a flavor of the kinds of tools that you can use, very practical tools, when you do design work to foreground human values. And in the work that we've done, um, we have, you know, these are two out of 17 or more value, um, methods that you can uh, use and draw upon. In the work that we've done, we've worked across um, a wide range of levels of human experience um, from, as I mentioned before, implantable cardiac devices. So with patients um, looking at how to do security for implantable medical devices, um, looking at people's interactions and children's interactions with robotic pets in small groups, looking at homeless young people and mobile phones, um, uh, public spaces, doing technology around transportation, um, looking at public records online, open source privacy licenses, all the way up to um, projects having to do with international um, justice systems. So the kinds of theory, theoretical framing that I've talked about today and the methods that I've been talking about are applicable at all of these different um, levels of human experience where you might be um, designing technical systems. So now what I'd like to do very briefly is give you um, just a couple examples of some real world projects so you can see what this looks like, um, not with a hypothetical example, but an actual uh, case study. So uh, this is a piece of research um, by Amy Van Weisberg looking at um, a, how to apply care ethics to the design of robots for healthcare. So Amy was um, very interested in a care ethic and the values that flow from care and thinking about the healthcare environment, um, particularly the situation where a healthcare worker needs to uh, lift a person from a bed move them to some other location temporarily, perhaps while you know bedding has changed, and then uh, safely move the person back. The challenge is, is that lifting and moving a person um, can be um, very challenging for the healthcare provider, especially if the healthcare provider is a smaller person um, or um, not um, a terribly strong person or the patient is a, a larger, heavier person. And of course, if a caregiver is moving many people, then there's the repeated strain. So one of the robotic designs um, for this situation is something that's called an auto lift. And uh, you can imagine a technology, it looks a lot like a forklift, except it's a robot. Um, so it can come in and it has um, these kinds of pallets and it will slide those under the patient, lift the patient, move them over and set them down safely. Um, and that design can be contrasted with something um, that's called an exoskeleton. So this is also a robotic technology, but what the exoskeleton does is it um, fits under the caregiver's arms. So the caregiver's hands and arms rest on top of the exoskeleton and then it's the caregiver's arms with the exoskeleton that slide under the patient, but the caregiver's hands are touching the patient. Um, the patient lifts the, um, uh, not the patient, the caregiver lifts the patient and um, is able to make eye contact, um, smile um, as they move um, the patient and set the patient down. 
So those are our two designs that, that um, Amy was looking at. And when she evaluated them, she enumerated criteria based on um, the standard technical criteria we might expect to see. So can you do this safely? Can you do it reliably? Can you do it efficiently? Will it be cost effective? Those are all the standard kinds of evaluation criteria um, you see in many engineering courses. And then because she brought a care ethics and value sensitive design to this design challenge, an additional criteria of care. So uh, that includes both touch and treating the patient with dignity. Um, and then you can see in this very simple table that with the criteria of safety, reliability, efficiency, and cost effectiveness, these two different designs, the auto lift and the exoskeleton are indistinguishable. They both do well on all of those four criteria. But the place where they really are differentiated is when it comes to care. So the auto lift does not include touch, doesn't treat the patient with dignity, and the exoskeleton allows the caregiver to touch, um, to look, um, to still maintain dignity of the patient. So in that sense, by having these additional um, criteria that you use in the design from the very beginning and actually as evaluation and as selection criteria when you choose what product you're going to buy and bring into your say hospital or assisted living setting, you can see that having a criteria tied to a value in this case of care allows you to make a choice that distinguishes between these two technologies and, and choosing the exoskeleton positions you um, as a in a healthcare setting as a caregiver to um, remain true to that value of care that's so important in those kinds of settings. So this is one very practical example of what it means to apply value sensitive design um, to an actual technical system and using values um, as criteria for evaluating your choice among technologies. And then just one more uh, brief example before I close. Um, so this is a much, um, you know, that example of the um, caregivers and the robots was a very specific, you can picture the hospital room, there's one robot, one patient. Um, the second example is a field-wide example. And it has to do with the kinds of um, metaphors and mental models that we use within our field um, to talk about the technologies that we're designing. So metaphors, by definition, are going to make certain things visible and hide other things. And that, in fact, is um, what makes them uh, strong and useful for us. Um, in work with Alan Borning we, and Nick Logler, we looked at um, the invisible materiality of information technology. And on the one hand, we recognize that we live on a finite planet, perhaps able to regenerate, but still finite. And then we looked and can see the metaphor that we use uh, for talking about the cloud. Um, you know, when I say a cloud, what comes to my mind are fluffy things up in the sky that float away that are kind of ephemeral and um, don't take up much space, just move around. Um, but in reality, what the cloud refers to is um, thousands upon tens of thousands of servers. And all of those servers suck huge amounts of electricity and power. They generate lots of heat, which requires lots of water to cool them. So the material implication of the cloud is enormous, huge. And yet the metaphor, the mental model of the cloud hides all of that materiality. And we would argue to the detriment of, um, of the planet and to the human species and to other creatures and life um, on the planet. So there's a lot at stake with the kinds of um, metaphors and mental models that we choose within our field and share with the public as a way to understand the work that we're doing. And so we can, for example, um, in the age of AI, artificial intelligence, you know, which is on everybody's um, tongue these days, ask ourselves, well, what is the mental model? What are the metaphors around AI 
that we are using to talk with the public about this technology and to think with about this technology as we design and build it. And we can ask ourselves about that, those metaphors, um, to what extent do they um, make visible or invisible the materiality of artificial intelligence? Um, and you can see once again, artificial intelligence is um, so often dependent on sensors, on being able to take um, information from the environment that requires huge amounts of physical material infrastructure, 24-7 um, computing, and on and on and on. So you can see, again, we are um, making invisible the materiality. So this is a call to all of us to think about the metaphors and the mental models we use as we invent new technologies. What will we do with brain machine interfaces, with DNA computing, with quantum computing as a field? Um, and so to think carefully about these. So these two, um, these two examples that I've just given you, you can think of them as bookends, right? Um, the one about robots and healthcare, you could see that single robot with a single um, caregiver in a hospital room or assisted living room with one patient. Um, and you can see the value implications there and how you can use values to choose um, actually the constraints for your design process that would shape your designs towards um, designs that would enable care, would enable touch, would enable dignity if those values were very visible to you throughout the design process. And then on the other end, we have an example of the very metaphors and mental models we use at the field level to talk about the work that we're doing. And here too, we need to attend to the values um, that we care about and ensure that these um, metaphors and mental models are making visible the aspects that we think are essential for human flourishing. So let me just close with some six practical uh, VSD takeaways. Um, there are methods, <laughs> use them <laughs> frequently and throughout the product development design engineering process. So these are tools there. If you were a carpenter, you would have a tool belt that would have, you know, um, hammers and, and levels and other kinds of tools and you would use those in the same way, value sensor design offers very practical tools that you can use to surface and engage with human values throughout your design and engineering process. Um, as Amy did in her work, use human values as a criteria for evaluating system performance alongside of other criteria that we are very familiar with and are important. So reliability, correctness. Um, so value sensitive design is envisioned to be used alongside of the um, already successful technical engineering practices that you have. It isn't meant to replace it, it's meant to coexist with it and strengthen it. You can think about co-evolving technology and social structure, a policy, uh, think long-term and at scale. And you saw that a little bit in the value scenario around sleeve. What happens when um, something like sleeve is used at scale over the long term and applied more broadly. Remember our planet, which is finite yet regenerative, and engineer within this constraint. If you do only one thing, but do that thing, the world will benefit from your engineering work. And then have the courage not to build. Just say no. If you find yourself in a situation where, for value reasons, the things that are important to people in their lives, the ethics and the morality, um, the thing that you are designing and building, you don't have confidence will contribute to human flourishing. Have the courage to say, no, that's not what we should be building now. We need to go back and rethink things. Um, so we need to bring our moral and technical imaginations together in the work um, that we do. Uh, so I think that, um, I want to talk a little bit about responsibility, remind you of best practices. Um, and when you don't engage with those best practices, we have the construct of negligence. Um, so if we have methods that can help us do a better job, we should be using those. And then if we don't use those, that's when we can cry negligence. 
and standards within the field can help us to define what those best practices are. And in fact, the IEEE is working on a standard P7000 that um, embeds many of the ideas from value sensitive design. So um, if as a field, we can embrace these kinds of standards, then we can move towards these kinds of best practices. I'm going to close with just two principles that, you know, over the many years that I've been doing this work, I um, come back to. And I think that um, these two, if I use them as my compass, put me in a good stead. So the first is dignity. In all of my designs, are the people who are affected, are they treated with dignity? Is their dignity intact? Is it enhanced? And then again, as I've mentioned, the planet. Remember that the planet is finite yet regenerative. In the work that we do, we ask for progress, not perfection. Just as it's not possible to design a system that is correct or a system that is reliable, um, that doesn't stop us from having methods that help us design things that are more reliable, more correct, and we hold those out for ourselves as ideal. And I would like to suggest to you, we need the same attitude towards designing for human values and human flourishing. Um, we hold those out as ideals. We know that we can't design something that um, will be perfect, but we can make progress. And as we um, practice and make progress, we'll learn from those experiences and be able to do things better. So our methods will improve, our best practices will improve. And so with that, I will stop and thank you so much for your kind attention and open things up for your questions and discussion comments. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Batya. Thank you very much uh, for opening a bit of our mind of the, not the, the relevance of value. I think we, all of us realize, you know, that we need to think about values, but I think it's very often so difficult to do. And, uh, you know, I think the fact that you have, you know, not just written about it, but also have these cards and, uh, you know, the building of scenarios that can help designers, you know, do the best they can. Um, my, my personal view is that designers in general, they're proud of the product, they're proud of their system, and, and they would take any method that is available to get it better at hand. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's great. Uh, and I will certainly have, have a look in, into this. I would like uh, to, to invite people to ask questions. Um, and while we're waiting, for questions to rise, I have uh, a question I think about because there are, of course, the direct users. And there are certain benefits uh, to be had of a lot of technology uh, for the immediate user. But the people around that, you gave that, that one example of the friendship, and uh, there, there are plenty other examples where it might be wonderful for the actual user, what I would call primary user. Uh, but not for other people around. I think thinking in that context, not always done, but that is sort of the first step. But if we think wider, you said, think at scale, we're talking about the planet. Where, where would you draw the line? Because whatever we do in, you know, in Singapore or even the US might impact someone in the world, you know, um, how, how would you deal with that? How far would you go uh, in order to make sure it's, it's good for all? Right. Well, so thank you. That's such a great question and such a hard question. Um, so I, I think I would answer that in a couple of different ways. Um, one is uh, to remind us about progress, not perfection. Um, so we probably won't satisfy everyone, and we probably will have um, some groups that may not that may not be positively affected by a design. Um, but that fact that we can't do that perfectly shouldn't stop us from beginning the work. And so 
one of the things that value sensitive design does is it legitimates all of the key stakeholders, all of the people who are affected by a design and doesn't say that a direct stakeholder is more important than an indirect stakeholder. So already it just changes um, the territory because if you are designing that medical record system, right, and your patient is the indirect stakeholder, they're on the table along with the physician, along with the insurance company. And they aren't in a um, second class seat because they aren't directly touching the technology. So you don't have to do a lot of work um, to argue for them. They're there. You've already been, they're legitimated by the process itself. As you um, generate stakeholders, and, uh, and you're right, in almost any of these larger systems, you will have many, many more categories of stakeholders than you likely have resources to engage with. So then you need to go through a prioritization process of um, asking yourself of the very many stakeholders um, who will be most affected. And sometimes I think one can also ask, are there groups, even if they're not most affected, they're often marginalized. And therefore we want to ensure that we bring them into the design process. But you can use a series of principles to help you with that prioritization. Um, sometimes there are certain stakeholder groups that you want to set aside for a reason, and that may be possible, but then you need to make that reason explicit. So it isn't that somebody just is ignored and, um, you know, they just aren't taken into account. You need to do it intentionally um, and visibly within your design process. So these are checks and balances on bringing a broader range of stakeholders into the design process. And then, um, yes, we have limited constraints and resources, um, of which time is probably the biggest one, right? So if you have a vast number of stakeholders, even if you had enough resources to talk to everyone, how would you have the time to do that? So the, the practical constraints of design come in, and then you need to um, you know, make hard calls along the way. But I think the important thing is that um, you're making a very different set of hard calls than one would typically do in, say, human-centered design when one's focused on the user or user-centered design. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question. Good oh, great. It's great. Yeah. I, I also agree that it's if we at least think about it, awareness of that you affect values, that you have impact on, on people, I think that, that would be a uh, first step. Uh, um, I think said thank you uh, to you for your good sharing and bring us back to the basic two key principles from Yang Chai. Um, and, uh, so thank you for this, uh, this call. Any other questions? Because this is not an easy issue um, we know. Maybe I can add, because many of us here are teachers or are actually also PC students, uh, Amaya. Um, do you teach this or at your university? Is this being taught? And in, in what way do you do that? Through projects or? Hello, I'm Sharon. Oh, hi, Sharon. Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to send a message. For some reason, I cannot find the button to send. Oh, I took, okay. That's all I fine. wanted to say was uh, I, I particularly like uh, uh, what Dakia said about the dignity, the consideration of dignity in design. I, I think that's a very insightful uh, you know, uh, uh, thought because when we teach students, very, you're very right that we only consider the technical implications, maybe sustainability you know, for the world and things like this. We all very often forget about the individual human being where mm -hmm. dignity is so important. So I'm very uh, inspired by that. And this is something certainly we would, you know, really tell our students to consider because when you design, it's really for the individual, although the benefits would be more. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Friedman. So yeah, I just wanted to say that. Well, thank you. I'm just wondering if there's a, are, do you see places in some of your, um, teaching or your own um, design or engineering work where dignity would be helpful to you? Um, yeah, because I think when students are learning to design, 
they 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 talked about all those practicalities, right? But they very often not think about. Although we did tell them, oh, now please consider uh, the 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 consideration. You won't be sued when you do certain things because it's the it's the ethics of it, you know. But mm -hmm. the ethics of it, when they consider that, they will consider it from the individual point of view of fear of being sued. You see what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. But really, they yeah. should be thinking about when you're designing for somebody, how do the person feel? Even if it's something that is practical, uh, f that you're designing for them, but would they make them any less? Uh, 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 they make them, that means that their, their disability is even highlighted although you've helped them, for instance, you know, so mm -hmm. how do they, they, they make them feel? So I think this is a very important aspect of design, which we often neglect, you know, in dignity. So thank you so much for that. But you were asking me whether is there something in particular, I can't think of it right now, but I would certainly think that this is one aspect when we get students to design things, to really be thinking about how the person feel, even though it is beneficial to the person, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and your example of the lift is, is, uh, is very, uh, it's very uh, appropriate because in in where I'm from in the Polytechnic, the engineering school did design something like that, to mm -hmm. for the for the patients. But what when you talked about the arm, the the one that the, you know you, there's a dignity to it. I thought there's something really interesting. I hope some of my colleagues from engineering have. Mm -hmm. have attended this, if not, I certainly would bring it back and tell them, uh, hey, you know, you've got to consider the dignity of the patient and you sort of just haul this person, especially this very large person, off the bed. You know, it's efficient, mm -hmm. but how did the person feel? So, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I can point you to the reference to Amy uh, Van Weisberg's paper on that too, if you're, if you're interested. Yes. I really like the example you were uh, talking about, which I think really does um, show up when you are designing for somebody who, um, you know, has atypical abilities, sometimes you might design something that gives them more ability, but in a way that diminishes their dignity. And yes. um, I think that often in those cases, someone would say, I would, I would rather not do it as well, but I'd like, but if I can do it in a way that maintains my dignity, <laughs> I yes. prefer that. Right, yeah. so that if, you know the performance isn't always um, the thing that is most important to the person. Yeah, oh, sorry. Can I just say one more thing? Because now that you prompted my 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 mind, I saw a BBC documentary on design, and this was about designing for somebody who could not go out because he had the disease. So all the time for him to go out, he had to wear a huge bubble on his head, which highlighted his his disability. You know, mm -hmm. and the BBC, I think the designers came up with something that actually uh, allowed him, I think it was, um, if I'm not mistaken, the bubble was reduced. And I think they wore, I, I, was it something about, I can't quite remember what it was, but it did not have that huge bubble on his head. Mm -hmm. So this was one of the dilemmas that they had, you know, although it worked, but the the person didn't want to go out because it looks ugly with that huge mm -hmm. bubble on his head. And also this is another thing to consider. Yeah, so thank you. Yes, very important okay. dignity. Thank you very much. And you can uh, tell your colleagues that the video uh, of this, so we have the recording and on our website, uh, you can point them uh, to that. So thank you very much for, for sharing that. Um, I saw Susanna Kuzana, uh, Susanna Krastas in Canada. Um, she asked whether you have worked with this approach in projects affecting indigenous community. Yeah, so I personally have not. However, some of the PhD students at the University of Washington have, I'm thinking in particular um, of uh, Lisa Dirk's work. Um, so she is herself an indigenous person and uh, works in healthcare. Uh, she's from Alaska, the state of Alaska. And she is um, doing her dissertation around um, the, how the results of medical research is brought back to the indigenous communities. So she is um, using value sense of design to understand how the um, 
indigenous people in the indigenous communities want to receive information, uh, health information and, and results from health uh, research. And then um, with that understanding is going to work with um, a facility that does a lot of health research around this community in um, thinking about how they can um, re, re conceive of what it means to relay research results back to this community. And so, for example, the communities she's working with um, use storytelling a lot in how they share information with each other. And so she, uh, her initial ideas here are to use um, the ways in which information is, short, is uh, shared in the community, these sort of uh, storytelling kinds of structures but use those in the service of distributing um, health results. So that's one, um, one piece of research um, that I'm aware of uh, with indigenous communities that are drawing on value sensitive design. And I can uh, put you in touch with Lisa if um, you're interested in following up with her. But thank you for that question. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time now. Um, and I've seen some people I know they had uh, other meetings or their lectures to go to. So I would like to uh, in name all of us. Thank you very much, Vatya, to open our minds and uh, um, make us think a little bit different about value. Uh, I'm sure that um, uh, you know, we will look into, I will definitely look into how could we use it in our, our teaching, our education. And I think for a university like SUTD wants to design for a better world, which is quite a, a mission to have, uh, that is, uh, would really, really suit us very well. Um, and uh, I think for anyone here who would like to know more, uh, I'm sure that, uh, uh, you know, you can contact um, uh, Batya. Uh, to so um, I see just one hand, uh, Oscar. You wanted to say something? You can keep it short. Uh, yeah. Hello. Sorry. Do we have time for a last quick question? Uh, last uh, quick, sure. quick question. <laughs> okay. Th thank you very much for your sharing. So I, I actually just wanted to ask. So um, I'm a part of a project where we have used uh, Professor Freeman's uh, value sensitive design approach to design a new medical device for for cancer imaging. And uh, it's been working very, very well. Um, the thing is just that I find that since the rest of my of the team that I'm working with are very technical and they look a lot towards the functionality and the technical aspects only, and I find it sometimes very hard to sort of make them kind of realize like that the VST approach is important and, and how it could be really used and utilized and how it could really benefit uh, the whole project and the whole system. And I wonder, uh, do Professor uh, Freeman have any advice to me to sort of how can I convince them like why is this uh, important and how could it make the whole uh, project more successful thank you so much yeah that's a, um, a really great a really great question I think that <clears throat> perhaps some of the examples we've talked about today could be helpful to your colleagues so for example the um, healthcare robot I think is a kind of example that a person who's largely technically focused can imagine their grandparent, for example, in an assisted living situation and can imagine those two robotic designs and can see why um, the um, exoskeleton solution, technical solution, would actually um, be favored by their um, grandparent. So the reason why stories like that I think are helpful is um, <clears throat> If um, with our technical colleagues, we can appeal to the human beings they care about and the human experiences they care about, and then can show how a technical design might help someone they care about flourish or feel better because it's sensitive to the values of that person, um, then we have um, in some ways demonstrated <laughs> um, the goal. And then you can go from that and say, now in our project, it's like this. Here's the counterpart. Um, in some ways, you might say that I've done the same thing with all of you today in this talk. So I could have um, told you about methods and talked a lot about methods, 
but instead I had you use a method and for yourself see that in a short period of time, you could surface the value implications around a new technology. Um, and so then I don't have to convince you with words that it's possible because you've already done that. And I, I think it's that same kind of strategy where finding the place in your colleagues' lives where they can see for themselves um, the example of a design sensitive to values that um, works better, um, then that may bring them some distance with you. And then you, of course, will have to do the work of showing them how in the current thing you're designing, you can get access to those values. But that's also where a tool like the envisioning cards might be very helpful. And um, they actually do come packaged with a little three minute timer. So um, for our technical colleagues, you might say, well, just give me 15 minutes of your time and let's use two or three of these cards on our project and you use the timer and maybe in 15 minutes you can use four cards and then um, people will see oh here are a bunch of the value considerations now how are we going to go forward with those so these are um, some of the kinds of strategies um, that i have used um, but i think it's it's often finding a way for your technical colleagues to see for themselves and generate for themselves the value implications that helps them make the leap to where they'll want to learn more and, and listen to you as you bring forward alternative designs. Um, I don't know, what, what have you tried and, and how did it work? <laughs> Maybe Oscar, you can update uh, Batya on uh, on your experiences with this. I, I think it's always very useful if you propose something or a methodology, if people uh, give feedback on how he used it or what was difficult. I always appreciate that, uh, and I'm sure uh, Batya did, did the same. Yeah, we. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You can send me a little email about that. Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with all of you and um, I appreciate uh, your time and attention today. Um, yeah, yeah, thank if you. If anyone very tries much. any of these things, yes, do let me know because I'm always interested in learning from what others' experiences will be. All right. Uh, good. Thank you very much again, Matja, for your presentation. Yeah. And as I mentioned uh, uh, on our website, you will find uh, the, we'll soon find the recording of this, if uh, you have colleagues who might be interested, then please uh, provide them with the link. And uh, we also have uh, uh, the, uh, the previous speaker and we have a further speaker in two weeks time uh, that, that you should have had an invitation also, uh, Katie Shiltron, um, who is the third speaker in our role of presentation. So I wish you all a very, very nice day and uh, maybe with a slightly changed mindset. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.